Welcome to Slasher Sunday. So, continuing on, we got Hatchet 3. Only one more after this, guys. Already done, man. We're already three weeks into this. It's crazy. But, I mean, usually I, I knock out a series in like a day or two, but um, I thought that spreading them out like this and doing one per week would make it feel like it lasted longer. Not really. I feel like I just did Hatchet 2, and I felt like right when I did that, I felt like I'd just done one. So, yeah, you know, it is what it is. All right, so we've got, just like the last movie, this one starts the second the last one leaves off. So you could watch this entire thing if you edit it together as a four-and-a-half-hour movie. Eh, like a four-hour movie. These are short. These are like an hour and 20. They're not even an hour and 30. They end real quick, man. When they start, and they start, like, especially two and three, they start. I don't know many films that start like these do. Um, so just an instant freaking cold opening, just bam, right to it, uh, reminding us of where we left off last time, which, as a continuity fan, of course, you know I'm a big, big uh, supporter of that. Um, so love seeing that. And then... <laughs> so last we saw Mary Beth had been standing over Victor Crowley blew his face apart he had like no head left I feel like he has more head left in this take on him but whatever it doesn't matter and so he attacks her his whole face is completely missing and hollow and she sticks her arm down his face into his throat. I thought she was going to pull his heart out that would have been pretty badass but she doesn't, and she was just trying to start a chainsaw, and here he goes and falls back on the chainsaw, and slowly the chainsaw comes up through him and chops him into two pieces. Cue the credits, Hatchet 3, uh, with what sounded like guar. That had to be guar, right? Gay Warriors Against Racism. is That's, the, that's, that's what it stands for, right? <laughs> that's what I remember it standing for. I haven't listened to guar in a long time but I will tell you this I was a really really big fan of Ragnarok holy shit I thought that album was freaking awesome especially like Surf of Sin um, but so much good shit on that album Meat Sandwich and The New Plague and I, I would people always say oh well no one listens to Guar for the music they always just go for the show like why do they even bother releasing albums and I'm like you clearly haven't listened to Ragnarok because that album is badass. It's funny. It's it's rock. You know, it's it's really good metal at times. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, all right. So that sounds. <laughs> it'll be stupid if it actually isn't Guar, but there's no way that's not. Um, and so Adam Green returns to write this one, but does not direct. And the director that did this. He's only ever done this movie. And this movie's old now, man. This movie's like 12 years old. Why the hell hasn't this guy done anything else? This is a fun-ass slasher movie. It feels very much in line with the last two and the next one. I mean, it fits really well. It has the exact same kind of tone and flow. And it, like if they, it said Adam Green in, it, it, you know, in the director's role, I wouldn't have questioned it for a second. So... I don't know. Maybe he didn't have enough of his own style. I, I don't know. But yeah, he just he never made anything else in the feature film area. He's made some music videos and whatnot, but no films. And that's kind of a shame. Anyway, uh, Adam Green, speaking of which, makes a cameo yet again as the character he played in the first one, the drunk Mardi Gras friend who the last time we saw him was vomiting on the sidewalk. And this time he's landed himself in jail to which he says he wishes he went on that swamp tour. Oh, if only he knew. Now, I don't remember if he's actually in Victor Crawley. I think it would be funny to have him being interviewed, like, in the background on a TV or something, like, you know, friend of murder victims or something, just to get him in there to have uh, some connectivity because um, Perry Jen is the only actor to be in all four movies, and obviously he doesn't play the same character in fact he only plays the same character in one movie which is Victor Crawley but yeah I like I think it's funny how instead of making him like a triplet 
they just go for the Asians look all alike joke. And he's like, what? what? Oh, I get it. I get it. We all look alike, right? I thought that that was a really, really funny and smart way to turn it into a gag, to turn it into some kind of like racist joke of like, yeah, no, that's not supposed to be the same guy. Like, it's supposed to be Asians all look alike. Or at least, you know, that's what the joke is. And I, thought, I think that's really funny. Um, and yeah, okay, so pro tip here. Don't walk into a police station covered in blood holding a scalp and a shotgun. You're probably going to get shot to death. Why does Mary Beth even go to the police station? I don't get it. Like, what, what was her purpose of being there? I, I'm still unclear on that. Because throughout the movie, I mean, what does she really do in this movie? She just kind of gets pulled around by Carolyn Williams' character, Stretch from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, which is always great to see her. But she pulls her around like, all right, we gotta, we've got to put Victor Crawley to rest once and for all. Okay, that's fine, but I feel like Mary Beth is just a tag-along in this movie. And that might be a big reason of why certain people dislike this movie. This movie seems to uh, not have as many fans as, as the first two fans of the franchise. This seems to be the one that, of the original three that they're not really big on. And I, I like this one um, just as much uh, as the others. So I don't know if that's because of the Mary Beth thing or whatnot, but yeah, it does feel like she's just a tag-along. It does feel like she doesn't really want to be there. Not the actress. I think Daniel Harris is is fine. I mean, she's she's as good as she is in the last one. It's just they don't really give her much to do. Now that being said, convincing the audience that she would go back again is extremely far fetched. Obviously, but they had to come up with something, and they're gonna they have a curse here, and the typical thing, you know. We gotta lay his body to rest, or all he wants is his dad, so we gotta find his urn and his ashes and whatnot. Okay, that's fine. I mean, of course, the convenience that this reporter just so happens to know the way to kill Victor Crawley and no one else does. I mean, she's a reporter, I guess, at very least. It's not like she was just a prisoner there next to her, and she's like, oh, I know how to kill Victor. If we get out of here, I'll let you know. Like, at least they made it, or should I say Adam Green made it, since he wrote it. But at least he did make it that um, sh her job would be trying to get the facts. And having grown up in, in that area, she would be fairly superstitious. That's a pretty superstitious area of the country. Um, so her belief in the supernatural and this and that and, and, and investigating on it and kind of collecting data and, and uh, knowledge on the subject, it's not all that far-fetched. Um, you know, but of course there's plenty of convenience. There's convenience that she's married to the sheriff and it's convenience that she just so happens to come in because of the police scanner and, and it's, it's all convenient. But it doesn't really matter. What it really comes down to is they needed an excuse for it but I feel like, as, as a tag-along, Mary Beth really doesn't do anything in the film. Plus, as I said, I don't know why she goes to the, to the police station. I don't know why she's so angry with everybody, especially the, the cop in this that like, lets her out and he's taking her around. And he's like, I'm going to protect you. It's going to be okay. And she like, spits in his face. I'm super, super confused about that. Shout out to Amanda Saylor, by the way. I, I should have said this in the opening. Uh, for actually watching this at the exact same time as me, and we were like having a little dialogue and text messages. She had never seen uh, it, any of this franchise. Never, I don't even know if she'd ever even heard of it, uh, but maybe she had, but she had never seen it. And so uh, she caught up with part two today to watch it with me tonight. So uh, shout out to her. But yeah, I just, I didn't understand that. I spit in his face. What did he do to her? Why is she so mad at everybody? Why is she acting so gruff? I don't get that part of her character in this. Like, her, her dad and her brother were killed, so she went back in and, Vic, and defeated Victor Crowley. She should be, like, celebrating, because up until it's revealed that he's still alive, she should be, like, stoked. She should have went home, washed that shit off of her, 
I mean, I'm glad she didn't because we get that shower scene, which is pretty sexy. Um, but I don't get it. I mean, I'm not trying to overthink this, of course. It's a slasher movie, and they just did what they did. But I feel like this could have played out differently and been just as effective. More effective in her regard. There, She's not really the main character here. She's just a tag-along. And I just, I'm confused by that decision, but... It is what it is. All right, so the cop in this, obviously, is played by Zach from Gremlins. And I feel like his death is pretty shocking in the film. It just kind of comes out of nowhere. Now, granted, these movies aren't very long, and this probably only happens 10 minutes before the movie ends. So how much longer would he have lasted? You just think he's going to meet his wife again when he puts his head out there. It's shocking, which is great. That's the kind of kills that you want in these kinds of movies. If you can see him coming from a mile away then I don't feel like they're doing their job. Now, you know pretty much everybody in this movie is going to die, and the only ones that don't, for sure, is Perry Shen's character here, um, and then left open for interpretation. I don't know if they mention it in Victor Crowley. They probably do. I only saw it once, and it was in theaters. Um, But, yeah, is she alive? Is she not? I don't know. So we'll find out in the next movie. Um, I'm sure somebody will tell me in the comments. But yeah, whatever. Uh, The shower scene. Now, those lady officers seem to be uh, as interested in her body as I was in that sequence. Uh, The one one cop there is... uh, can't. I don't really know what her name is. I should know it, but she's been in tons of shit like uh, Feast 2 and 3 and The Collector, and I like her. But, uh, yeah, of course, lots of cameos. Lots and lots and lots of cameos from horror... Uh, people so no shocker there because we've gotten them in all three of these now and we get them in the next one as well the whole like him critiquing the plot of the of what Mary Beth is telling him and then Adam Green's character looking up all offended is really really funny meta humor that's like really smart meta funny humor I thought anyways I think I think that's a really cute way to do meta humor because it's just you have to you have to depend on your audience knowing that that's Adam Green and that he wrote the movies and that he's kind of putting a dig onto himself by writing that in this film and his character being played by himself is like offended by this I would only I would I could only imagine like what someone who doesn't know that that's him would think in that moment. Like, why is that guy looking like that? You know? So I would, I would be curious to know the, the opinion of someone who was like, Oh, that's him. And that's what that joke meant. And I didn't even, I didn't even think that was a joke. You know, that's really subtle meta humor, good stuff. Um, and I already said all this shit. Um, Oh, that one kill on the, the dude with the eye patch and she cuts him down right here with a hatchet and it splits his head open and half his brain falls out. Good stuff. Really great kills in this. I mean, lots of amazing practical effects. I don't think there's... I'm trying to think if there's any CG in this almost at all. Um, maybe there's a little on, on Victor's face melting at the end. Maybe. I don't... I'm not sure or not. Um, I'm not thinking of any at the moment. So, I mean, you're talking all practical and almost all on screen. That alone is worth the price of admission and that Daniel Harris shower scene. Uh, (laughs) Didn't hurt either. Uh, We got the defibrillator to the head here on uh, the dude from... I've mentioned this guy so many times. I I should freaking know his name by now. But uh, the the dude from Jury Duty, the bad dude from Jury Duty, who I was talking about, is the dude from the milk commercial. Got milk. Yeah, you, you know what I'm talking about if you're my age. Uh, we got Derek Mears in here. Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th reboot. So I think that's kind of cool to see Vic, uh, Victor Crawley. Victor Crawley played by Kane Hodder. Kane Hodder, the, the most recognizable Jason figure going up against the newest Jason figure at that point and still is because they can't get that freaking dispute uh, done with so who knows we'll see a Friday the 13th eventually but you know we don't know when 
Um, and <laughs> that dude not asking for backup. He's like, that one kid's just like, your ego's going to get us killed. And he was right. And that kid carrying around like a freaking rocket launcher. Ridiculous. <laughs> That's fucking ridiculous. Where the hell they even get that? Would he even be allowed to have that? Um, I would think that would be military only. But he's carrying it around. And, uh, of course, we got some Predator stuff going on here. We we see that a lot in movies. So they blind fire out into the forest. And then they go out there to check what it is. And it's a dead animal. Um, and then Derek Mears gets his head ripped out of his body by the spine. Another Predator thing. So a couple Predator stuff there. They fire so many bullets, too. That's That's always been one of my funny critiques of Predator is like, how much ammo did you bring? How much? Because you only can carry so much and you just fired so, so many bullets blindly. And they fire, I mean, how many times did they fire their weapons before they ever even see Victor Crawley? I feel like they'd have to have like 15 mags each just to keep up with how many bullets they fire. But whatever. So then the cop massacre happens. He comes out pulls one in, they fire into this building, they can't see him, they can't see him, they just keep firing. You know, nobody ever reloads, of course. And um, then he rips a dude in half, picks him up and just yanks him in half and then grabs uh, another dude and curb stomps his face. That That's happened almost enough times here. I will say the dude who was afraid of him the whole time, who tried to run away multiple times, and I guess he probably would have lived if people would have let him, but he, before he shoots, a, or right after he shoots a rocket launcher into the wrong guy, which I feel like that joke should have landed harder. Um, it's a good setup, and it's fine, and it hits him and all that. It's just, I don't know. It should have been funnier. The way, maybe it was the, the way it was shot, it looked really silly to me. But regardless, he pins him down, rips both his arms off. And I was thinking like, oh man, wouldn't it be great if he just grabbed his legs, ripped those off, and then took his, you know, armless, legless body uh, and just threw it out in the water. And then you just see this guy like bobbing in the water, just floating there, sinking. Remember that old joke? What do you, like, the, the joke, oh God, I can't even remember how like exactly the setup goes, but essentially a, a girl... Um, is laying on the beach with no arms and no legs, and she, convinced, you know, she's telling this guy, "I've always wanted to be kissed. I always want," and he kisses her. I've always wanted to be fucked, and he grabs her and he throws her out in the ocean, and he's like, "There, you're fucked." You know that joke. That's, I guess, probably where I got that uh, that idea. But it would have been funny to see. Maybe he's like trying to swim with his head. <laughs> he's the armless, legless dude just bobbing out in the water. That would have been so messed up. Um, and then Sid Haig's character. I mean, obviously he just died, so um, it's 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 cool to see him. Uh, sad, of course, but Sid Haig's character in this is pretty hilarious. He probably is my favorite moment in the film. The racist shit he's doing with the cop is fucking, is so messed up, but it is really, really funny. Um, and I like that Joel... Uh, I can't remember what his name is now uh, from the first movie comes back to make an appearance just a brief cameo that's always so cool when they'll do that come back for like a minute Um, but yeah he pops up and you're like dude he lived he lived for like two days in that damn boat and then just instantly is killed and he's like you gotta be fucking kidding me and then which I told you I think I just mentioned this in another video I made a couple days ago. That's got to be the most overused line in film. But anyway, so then the other guy gets attacked by a gator. And and Victor Crawley's like, that'll do, Croc. That'll do. Just lets him go. Um, And then I love that that when, uh, you know, the sheriff is called and he's asked, by the radio dispatcher who's going to send more troops and whatnot. He's just like, who is it? And he's like, Victor Crowley. And he's like, say again? And he kind of looks around and he's like, 
we're being pinned down by our gunmen or whatever. And it's just like, yes, thank you. Never tell the truth in that situation. If you're ever in a situation where there's a ghost attacking or some local legend or whatever, and you tell them like, oh yeah, this is what's going on. They're going to be like, okay, we'll send people right over, buddy. See you then. And then they get off and be like, want to hear about this joke call? So yeah, always make it something else. It's like that whole idea of like, don't don't yell rape, yell fire. <laughs> Such a fucking evil thing. Oh uh, God, I I don't know. I don't know. Is that true? Is that really true? Yell rape or yell fire. See, that doesn't make any sense to me though, because aren't you yelling like get out of the building? That's never made any sense to me. Can someone explain that to me? Why would yelling fire? bring people to your rescue i guess they're breaking into your house to like save you from the fire but people are terrified of fire as well like the whole thing about rape isn't it like supposed to be they don't want to deal with the what's going on there they don't want to have to fight off some person i don't know what the mindset is okay i'm going off on a fucking but i just fire man i feel like so many people will be like fire oh shit you know and run away i guess they'll call the police but by that time it's too fucking late i mean how long is this guy gonna be raping her for this is a grim conversation okay um and yeah i already talked about all that why would this chick go for a gun the girl in the boat with, with Perry Shen's character, like, really? She's, like, reaching slowly, slowly, slowly. And he's like, go and go for it. You just watched tr- freaking other trained, you know, SWAT officers, whatever these guys are, fire a thousand bullets into this dude. And he's just fine. But, oh, better pick up that freaking handgun. That's his weakness right there is handgun bullets. You haven't tried that yet. Just so stupid. Why even pick that up? You know you're gonna get pegged. I like that. I he talks in this. I'm fine with my 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 voiceless killer saying a word or two. Let it go. It's fine. It's okay. I mean, he he does yell out. Like I think I guess he does speak in this franchise. I think he's like yelling out like I don't know if he. I think he does. I think he says the word like daddy or something. But he actually is like daddy. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care. I'm the guy who didn't care when Rob Zombie made Michael Myers speak at the end of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. I thought it was good, so I'm an asshole. I just, I don't know, people are too traditional. They're just, oh, he doesn't speak. He can never speak. But they love Silent Bob movies, right? And when he just waits the whole film to speak at the end. Whatever, anyway. Um, Then Mary Beth is impaled right through the freaking liver. And uh, she smashes the ashes on his face. So if he would have picked up the ashes before the cop shot him, would he have then died from that? Or did the ashes actually just from the beginning needed to be poured onto his head so that he could melt down? Good thing he didn't melt down into a little boy. We've already had that happen with Kane Hodder's slasher character. So let's, let's be thankful. Uh, that shit should that that shit didn't happen, and that was his third film in the franchise as well. Ugh. The whole melting down of things. Oh my god, how dumb is that? How fucking what were they thinking in Friday the Thirteenth Part Eight? Jason takes Manhattan when he gets when there's toxic waste that comes through the sewer system, hits him, and then it turns him into a little boy. Like what was the thought? How do you pitch an idea like that and and then actually shoot it and put it on screen? It's baffling to me. Anyway. Um, and then and then Mary Beth just sits there and she's like, come on, come on, get back up. Move, you know, do it already. Do it already. Why? Like, just shoot him like you do. I don't understand that moment. She's trying to prove to herself that this isn't over, like she knows it. This ain't, this can't be it. And then she finally gives up and is like, "Oh fuck it," and blows it away. Like, I don't know. That seems really silly to me. Just you want him to come back, or if he starts to regenerate, then you know you've lost. I, a shotgun ain't gonna do shit. So I don't know. It just it didn't make any sense to me in the moment. I was just like, oh, "Okay, I guess." 
But and then yeah, the final gasp here is that her final gasp of air, or is that her showing us that she's still breathing, that she's still alive? Uh, we'll find out in Victor Crawley next week. But um, it's a fun sequel. I know a lot of people are down on it. Uh, I had always cited it as my favorite in the franchise, having watched all of three of these back to back, and I obviously have four to watch, which I've only seen once. Um, I will make my my final uh, assessment on on my ranking, so to speak, of the franchise. But I feel like one, two, and three are really complementary. I feel like they all play really well into one another. They almost all blend so well together that it's hard to pick a favorite of the three. I think they're all strong in their own right. Um, so, and I don't really know what I would say on that behalf. But for now, there you go. Hatchet 3. See you next week for Victor Crawley.